Theodore Roosevelt Jr. October 27, 1858 January 6, 1919, was an American statesman, author, explorer, soldier, and naturalist, who served as the 26th President of the United States from 1901 to 1909. He also served as the 25th Vice President of the United States from March to September 1901 and as the 33rd Governor of New York from 1899 to 1900. As a leader of the Republican Party during this time, he became a driving force for the progressive era in the United States in the early 20th century. His face is depicted on Mount Rushmore alongside those of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. Roosevelt was born a sickly child with debilitating asthma, but he overcame his physical health problems by embracing a strenuous lifestyle. He integrated his exuberant personality, vast range of interests, and world-famous achievements into a cowboy persona defined by robust masculinity. Homeschooled he began a lifelong naturalist avocation before attending Harvard College. His book, The Naval War of 1812-1882, established his reputation as both a learned historian and as a popular writer. Upon entering politics, he became the leader of the reform faction of Republicans in New York State Legislature. Following the near-simultaneous deaths of his wife and mother, he escaped to a cattle ranch in the Dakotas. Roosevelt served as Assistant Secretary of the Navy under President William McKinley, but resigned from that post to lead the Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. Returning a war hero, he was elected Governor of New York in 1898. After the death of Vice President Garrett Hobart, the New York State Party leadership convinced McKinley to accept Roosevelt as his running mate in the 1900 election. Roosevelt campaigned vigorously, and the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket won a landslide victory based on a platform of peace, prosperity, and conservatism. After taking office as vice president in March 1901, he became president at age 42 following McKinley's assassination that September and remains the youngest person to become president. As a leader of the progressive movement, he championed his square deal domestic policies, promising the average citizen fairness, breaking of trusts, regulation of railroads, and pure food and drugs. Making conservation a top priority, he established many new national parks, forests, and monuments intended to preserve the nation's natural resources. In foreign policy, he focused on Central America, where he began construction of the Panama Canal. He expanded the Navy and sent the Great White Fleet on a world tour to project the United States naval power around the globe. His successful efforts to broker the end of the Russo-Japanese War won him the 1906 Nobel Peace Prize. He avoided the controversial tariff and money issues. Elected in 1904 to a full term, Roosevelt continued to promote progressive policies, but many of his efforts and much of his legislative agenda were eventually blocked in Congress. Roosevelt successfully groomed his close friend, William Howard Taft, and Taft won the 1908 presidential election to succeed him. In polls of historians and political scientists, Roosevelt is generally ranked as one of the five best presidents. Frustrated with Taft's conservatism, Roosevelt belatedly tried to win the 1912 Republican nomination. He failed, walked out, and founded a third party, the progressive, so-called Bull Moose Party, which called for wide-ranging progressive reforms. The split allowed the Democrats to win the White House. Following his election defeat, Roosevelt led a two-year expedition to the Amazon Basin, where he nearly died of tropical disease. During World War I, he criticized President Woodrow Wilson for keeping the country out of the war with Germany, and his offer to lead volunteers to France was rejected. Though he had considered running for president again in 1920, Roosevelt's health continued to deteriorate, and he died in 1919. Early Life and Family 
Theodore Roosevelt Jr. was born on October 27, 1858, at East 20th Street in New York City. He was the second of four children born to socialite Martha Stewart Mitty Bullock and businessman and philanthropist Theodore Roosevelt Sr. He had an older sister, Anna, nicknamed Bammy, a younger brother, Elliot, and a younger sister, Corinne. Elliot was later the father of First Lady Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, the wife of Theodore's distant cousin, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His paternal grandfather was of Dutch descent, his other ancestry included primarily Scottish and Scots-Irish, English, and smaller amounts of German, Welsh, and French. Theodore Sr. was the fifth son of businessman Cornelius Van Scock CVS. Roosevelt and Margaret Barnhill Theodore's fourth cousin, James Roosevelt I, who was also a businessman, was the father of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mitty was the younger daughter of Major James Stevens Bullock and Martha P. Patsy Stewart. Through the Van Scocks, Roosevelt was a descendant of the Schuyler family. Roosevelt's youth was largely shaped by his poor health and debilitating asthma. He repeatedly experienced sudden nighttime asthma attacks that caused the experience of being smothered to death, which terrified both Theodore and his parents. Doctors had no cure. Nevertheless, he was energetic and mischievously inquisitive. His lifelong interest in zoology began at age seven when he saw a dead seal at a local market. After obtaining the seal's head, Roosevelt and two cousins formed what they called the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. Having learned the rudiments of taxidermy, he filled his makeshift museum with animals that he killed or caught, he then studied the animals and prepared them for display. At age nine, he recorded his observation of insects in a paper entitled The Natural History of Insects. Roosevelt's father significantly influenced him. His father was a prominent leader in New York's cultural affairs, he helped to found the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and had been especially active in mobilizing support for the Union during the Civil War, even though his in-laws included Confederate leaders. Roosevelt said, My father, Theodore Roosevelt, was the best man I ever knew. He combined strength and courage with gentleness, tenderness, and great unselfishness. He would not tolerate in us children selfishness or cruelty, idleness, cowardice, or untruthfulness. Family trips abroad, including tours of Europe in 1869 and 1870, and Egypt in 1872, shaped his cosmopolitan perspective. Hiking with his family in the Alps in 1869, Roosevelt found that he could keep pace with his father. He had discovered the significant benefits of physical exertion to minimize his asthma and bolster his spirits. Roosevelt began a heavy regime of exercise. After being manhandled by two older boys on a camping trip, he found a boxing coach to teach him to fight and strengthen his weakened body. Roosevelt was minimally religious. He grew up in the Dutch Reformed Church and gradually switched to attending his wife's Episcopalian church. Biographer Edmund Morris states, When consoling bereaved people, he would awkwardly invoke unseen and unknown powers. Aside from a few clichés of Protestant rhetoric, the gospel he preached had always been political and pragmatic. He was inspired less by the passion of Christ than by the golden rule that appealed to reason amounting, in his mind to a worldly rather than heavenly law. Education Roosevelt was mostly homeschooled by tutors and his parents. Biographer H. W. Brands argued that the most obvious drawback to his homeschooling was uneven coverage of the various areas of human knowledge. He was solid in geography and bright in history, biology, French, and German, however he struggled in mathematics and the classical languages. When he entered Harvard College on September 27, 1876, his father advised, take care of your morals first, your health next, and finally your studies. His father's sudden death on February 9, 
1878, devastated Roosevelt, but he eventually recovered and doubled his activities. He did well in science, philosophy and rhetoric courses but continued to struggle in Latin and Greek. He studied biology intently and was already an accomplished naturalist and a published ornithologist, he read prodigiously with an almost photographic memory. While at Harvard, Roosevelt participated in rowing and boxing, he was once runner-up in a Harvard boxing tournament. Roosevelt was a member of the Alpha Delta Phi Literary Society, the Delta Kappa Epsilon Fraternity, and the prestigious Porcelain Club. He was also an editor of the Harvard Advocate. In 1880, Roosevelt graduated Phi Beta Kappa, 22nd of 177, from Harvard with an AB Magna Cum Laude. Biographer Henry Pringle states, Roosevelt attempting to analyze his college career and weigh the benefits he had received, felt that he had obtained little from Harvard. He had been depressed by the formalistic treatment of many subjects, by the rigidity, the attention to minutiae that were important in themselves, but which somehow were never linked up with the whole. After his father's death, Roosevelt had inherited $125,000, enough to live comfortably for the rest of his life. Roosevelt gave up his earlier plan of studying natural science and instead decided to attend Columbia Law School, moving back into his family's home in New York City. Roosevelt was an able law student, but he often found law to be irrational, he spent much of his time writing a book on the War of 1812. Determined to enter politics, Roosevelt began attending meetings at Morton Hall, the 59th Street headquarters of New York's 21st District Republican Association. Though Roosevelt's father had been a prominent member of the Republican Party, the younger Roosevelt made an unorthodox career choice for someone of his class, as most of Roosevelt's peers refrained from becoming too closely involved in politics. Nonetheless, Roosevelt found allies in the local Republican Party, and he defeated an incumbent Republican state assemblyman closely tied to the political machine of Senator Roscoe Conkling. After his election victory, Roosevelt decided to drop out of law school, later saying, I intended to be one of the governing class. Naval History and Strategy While at Harvard, Roosevelt began a systematic study of the role played by the young United States Navy in the War of 1812. Assisted by two uncles, he scrutinized original source materials and official U.S. Navy records. Roosevelt's carefully researched book, published in 1882, remains one of the most important scholarly studies of the war, complete with drawings of individual and combined ship maneuvers, charts depicting the differences in iron throw weights of cannon shot between rival forces, and analyses of the differences between British and American leadership down to the ship-to-ship -ship level. Published in 1882, the Naval War of 1812 was praised for its scholarship and style, and it showed Roosevelt to be a scholar of history. It remains a standard study of the war. With the publication of The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, 1660-1783 In 1890, Navy Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan was immediately hailed as the world's outstanding naval theorist by the leaders of Europe. Roosevelt paid very close attention to Mahan's emphasis that only a nation with the world's most powerful fleet could dominate the world's oceans, exert its diplomacy to the fullest, and defend its own borders. He incorporated Mahan's ideas into his views on naval strategy for the remainder of his career. First Marriage and Widowerhood On his 22nd birthday in 1880, Roosevelt married socialite Alice Hathaway Lee. Their daughter, Alice Lee Roosevelt, was born on February 12, 1884. Two days after giving birth, Roosevelt's wife died due to an undiagnosed case of kidney failure, called Bright's disease at the time, which had been masked by the pregnancy. In his diary, Roosevelt wrote a large X on the page and then, the light has gone out of my life. 
His mother, Mitty, had died of typhoid fever 11 hours earlier at 3 a.m., in the same house. Distraught, Roosevelt left baby Alice in the care of his sister Bammy in New York City while he grieved. He assumed custody of his daughter when she was three. After the death of his wife and mother, Roosevelt focused on his work, specifically by re-energizing a legislative investigation into corruption of the New York City government, which arose from a concurrent bill proposing that power be centralized in the mayor's office. For the rest of his life, he rarely spoke about his wife Alice and did not write about her in his autobiography. While working with Joseph Buckland Bishop on a biography that included a collection of his letters, Roosevelt did not mention his marriage to Alice nor his second marriage to Edith Kermit Caro. Early Political Career State Assemblyman Roosevelt was a member of the New York State Assembly, New York Co., 21st D., in 1882, 1883 and 1884. He immediately began making his mark, specifically in corporate corruption issues. He blocked a corrupt effort by financier Jay Gould to lower his taxes. Roosevelt exposed suspected collusion in the matter by Judge Theodore Westbrook, and argued for and received approval for an investigation to proceed, aiming for the impeachment of the judge. The investigation committee rejected impeachment, but Roosevelt had exposed the potential corruption in Albany, and thus assumed a high and positive political profile in multiple New York publications. Roosevelt's anti-corruption efforts helped him win re-election in 1882 by a margin greater than 2 to 1, an achievement made even more impressive by the fact that Democratic gubernatorial candidate Grover Cleveland won Roosevelt's district. With Conkling's stalwart faction of the Republican Party in disarray following the assassination of President James Garfield, Roosevelt won election as the Republican Party leader in the state assembly. He allied with Governor Cleveland to win passage of a civil service reform bill. Roosevelt won re-election a second time, and sought the office of Speaker of the New York State Assembly, but was defeated by Titus Sherd in a 41-29 vote of the GOP caucus. In his final term, Roosevelt served as chairman of the Committee on Affairs of Cities, he wrote more bills than any other legislator. Presidential Election of 1884 With numerous presidential hopefuls to choose from, Roosevelt supported Senator George F. Edmonds of Vermont, a colorless reformer. The state GOP preferred the incumbent president, New York City's Chester Arthur, who was known for passing the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act. Arthur, at the time, was suffering from Bright's disease unknown to the public, and out of duty he did not contest his own nomination. Roosevelt fought hard and succeeded in influencing the Manhattan delegates at the state convention in Utica. He then took control of the state convention, bargaining through the night and outmaneuvering the supporters of Arthur and James G. Blaine, he gained a national reputation as a key person in New York State. Roosevelt attended the 1884 GOP National Convention in Chicago and gave a speech convincing delegates to nominate African-American John R. Lynch, an Edmonds supporter, to be temporary chair. Roosevelt fought alongside the Mugwump reformers, however, Blaine, having gained support from Arthur's and Edmonds delegates, won the nomination by 541 votes on the fourth ballot. In a crucial moment of his budding political career, Roosevelt resisted the demand of the Mugwumps that he bowled from Blaine. He bragged about his one small success, we achieved a victory in getting up a combination to beat the Blaine nominee for temporary chairman. To do this needed a mixture of skill, boldness and energy, to get the different factions to come in, to defeat the common foe. He was also impressed by an invitation to speak before an audience of 10,000, the largest crowd he had addressed up to that date. Having gotten a taste of national politics, Roosevelt felt less aspiration for advocacy on the state level, he then retired to his new Chimney Butte ranch on the Little Missouri River. 
Roosevelt refused to join other mugwumps in supporting Grover Cleveland, the governor of New York and the Democratic nominee in the general election. He debated the pros and cons of staying loyal with his political friend, Henry Cabot Lodge. After Blaine won the nomination, Roosevelt had carelessly said that he would give hearty support to any decent Democrat. He distanced himself from the promise, saying that it had not been meant for publication. When a reporter asked if he would support Blaine, Roosevelt replied, That question I decline to answer. It is a subject I do not care to talk about. In the end, he realized that he had to support Blaine to maintain his role in the GOP, and he did so in a press release on July 19. Having lost the support of many reformers, Roosevelt decided to retire from politics and move to North Dakota. Cowboy in Dakota Roosevelt moved west following the 1884 presidential election, and he built a second ranch named Elkhorn, which was 35 miles, 56 kilometers, north of the boom town of Medora, North Dakota. Roosevelt learned to ride western style, rope, and hunt on the banks of the Little Missouri. Though he earned the respect of the authentic cowboys, they were not overly impressed. However, he identified with the herdsman of history, a man he said possesses, few of the emasculated, milk and water moralities admired by the pseudo-philanthropists, but he does possess, to a very high degree, the stern, manly qualities that are invaluable to a nation. He reoriented, and began writing about frontier life for national magazines. He also published three books Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, Ranch Life, and The Hunting Trail, and The Wilderness Hunter. Roosevelt brought his desire to address the common interests of citizens to the West. He successfully led efforts to organize ranchers to address the problems of overgrazing and other shared concerns. His work resulted in the formation of the Little Missouri Stockmen's Association. He was also compelled to coordinate conservation efforts and was able to form the Boone and Crockett Club, whose primary goal was the conservation of large game animals and their habitats. After the uniquely severe U.S. winter of 1886-87 wiped out his herd of cattle and those of his competitors, and with it over half of his $80,000 investment, Roosevelt returned to the East. Though his finances suffered from the experience, Roosevelt's time in the West helped remove the stigma of an ineffectual intellectual that could have hampered his political career. Second Marriage On December 2, 1886, Roosevelt married his childhood and family friend, Edith Kermit Caro. Roosevelt was deeply troubled that his second marriage had taken place so soon after the death of his first wife, and he faced resistance from his sisters. Nonetheless, the couple married at St. George's, Hanover Square in London, England. The couple had five children, Theodore Ted III in 1887, Kermit in 1889, Ethel in 1891, Archibald in 1894, and Quinton in 1897. The couple also raised Roosevelt's daughter from his first marriage, Alice, who often clashed with her stepmother. Re-entering Public Life Upon Roosevelt's return to New York in 1886, Republican leaders quickly approached him about running for mayor of New York City. Roosevelt accepted the nomination despite having little hope of winning the race against United Labour Party candidate Henry George and Democratic candidate Abram Hewitt. Roosevelt campaigned hard for the position, but Hewitt won with 41%, 90,552 votes, taking the votes of many Republicans who feared George's radical policies. George was held to 31%, 68,110 votes, and Roosevelt took third place with 27%, 60,435 votes. Fearing that his political career might never recover, Roosevelt turned his attention to writing The Winning of the West, a historical work tracking the westward movement of Americans. The book was a great success for Roosevelt, 
earning favorable reviews and selling numerous copies. Civil Service Commission After Benjamin Harrison unexpectedly defeated Blaine for the presidential nomination at the 1,888 Republican National Convention, Roosevelt gave stump speeches in the Midwest in support of Harrison. On the insistence of Henry Cabot Lodge, President Harrison appointed Roosevelt to the United States Civil Service Commission, where he served until 1895. While many of his predecessors had approached the office as a sinecure, Roosevelt vigorously fought the spoilsmen and demanded enforcement of civil service laws. The New York Sun then described Roosevelt as irrepressible, belligerent, and enthusiastic. Roosevelt frequently clashed with Postmaster General John Wanamaker, who handed out numerous patronage positions to Harrison supporters, and Roosevelt's attempt to force out several postal workers damaged Harrison politically. Despite Roosevelt's support for Harrison's re-election bid in the presidential election of 1892, the eventual winner, Grover Cleveland, reappointed him to the same post. Roosevelt's close friend and biographer, Joseph Buckland Bishop, described his assault on the spoils system. The very citadel of spoils politics, the hitherto impregnable fortress that had existed unshaken since it was erected on the foundation laid by Andrew Jackson, was tottering to its fall under the assaults of this audacious and irrepressible young man. Whatever may have been the feelings of the fellow Republican Party, President, Harrison, and there is little doubt that he had no idea when he appointed Roosevelt that he would prove to be so veritable a bull in a china shop he refused to remove him and stood by him firmly till the end of his term. New York City Police Commissioner In 1894, a group of reform Republicans approached Roosevelt about running for mayor of New York again, he declined mostly due to his wife's resistance to being removed from the Washington social set. Soon after he declined, he realized that he had missed an opportunity to reinvigorate a dormant political career. He retreated to the Dakotas for a time, his wife Edith regretted her role in the decision and vowed that there would be no repeat of it. William Lafayette Strong, a reform-minded Republican, won the 1,894 mayoral election and offered Roosevelt a position on the board of the New York City Police Commissioners. Roosevelt became president of the Board of Commissioners and radically reformed the police force. Roosevelt implemented regular inspections of firearms and annual physical exams, appointed recruits based on their physical and mental qualifications rather than political affiliation, established meritorious service medals, and closed corrupt police hostelries. During his tenure, a municipal lodging house was established by the Board of Charities, and Roosevelt required officers to register with the board, he also had telephones installed in station houses. In 1894, Roosevelt met Jacob Rees, the muckraking Evening Sun newspaper journalist who was opening the eyes of New Yorkers to the terrible conditions of the city's millions of poor immigrants with such books as How the Other Half Lives. Reese described how his book affected Roosevelt. When Roosevelt read book, he came. No one ever helped as he did. For two years we were brothers in, New York City's crime-ridden, Mulberry Street. When he left I had seen its golden age. There is very little ease where Theodore Roosevelt leads, as we all of us found out. The lawbreaker found it out who predicted scornfully that he would knuckle down to politics the way they all did, and lived to respect him, though he swore at him, as the one of them all who was stronger than Pull, that was what made the age golden, that for the first time a moral purpose came into the street. In the light of it everything was transformed. Roosevelt made a habit of walking officers' beats late at night and early in the morning to make sure that they were on duty. He made a concerted effort to uniformly enforce New York's Sunday closing law, in this, he ran up against boss Tom Platt as well as Tammany Hall he was notified that the police commission was being legislated out of existence. Roosevelt chose to defer rather than split with his party. As governor of New York State, 
he would later sign an act replacing the police commission with a single police commissioner. Emergence as a national figure. Assistant Secretary of the Navy. In the 1896 presidential election, Roosevelt backed Speaker of the House Thomas Brackett Reed for the Republican nomination, but William McKinley won the nomination and defeated William Jennings Bryan in the general election. Roosevelt opposed Bryan's free silver platform, viewing many of Bryan's followers as dangerous fanatics, and Roosevelt gave campaign speeches for McKinley. Urged by Congressman Henry Cabot Lodge, President McKinley appointed Roosevelt as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. Secretary of the Navy John D. Long was more concerned about formalities than functions, was in poor health, and left many major decisions to Roosevelt. Influenced by Alfred Thayer Mahan, Roosevelt called for a build-up in the country's naval strength, particularly the construction of battleships. Roosevelt also began pressing his national security views regarding the Pacific and the Caribbean on McKinley, and was particularly adamant that Spain be ejected from Cuba. He explained his priorities to one of the Navy's planners in late 1897. I would regard war with Spain from two viewpoints, first, the advisability on the grounds both of humanity and self-interest of interfering on behalf of the Cubans and of taking one more step toward the complete freeing of America from European dominion, second, the benefit done our people by giving them something to think of which is not material gain, and especially the benefit done our military forces by trying both the Navy and Army in actual practice. On February 15, 1898, the main exploded in the harbor of Havana, Cuba, killing hundreds of crew members. While Roosevelt and many other Americans blamed Spain for the explosion, McKinley sought a diplomatic solution. Without approval from Long or McKinley, Roosevelt sent out orders to several naval vessels, directing them to prepare for war. George Dewey, who had received an appointment to lead the Asiatic Squadron with the backing of Roosevelt, later credited his victory at the Battle of Manila Bay to Roosevelt's orders. After finally giving up hope of a peaceful solution, McKinley asked Congress to declare war upon Spain, beginning the Spanish-American War. War in Cuba With the beginning of the Spanish-American War in late April 1898, Roosevelt resigned from his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Along with Army Colonel Leonard Wood, he formed the 1st U.S. Volunteer Cavalry Regiment. His wife and many of his friends begged Roosevelt to remain in his post in Washington, but Roosevelt was determined to see battle. When the newspapers reported the formation of the new regiment, Roosevelt and Wood were flooded with applications from all over the country. Referred to by the press as the Rough Riders, the regiment was one of many temporary units active only for the duration of the war. The regiment trained for several weeks in San Antonio, Texas, and in his autobiography Roosevelt wrote that his prior experience with the New York National Guard had been invaluable, in that it enabled him to immediately begin teaching his men basic soldiering skills. The Rough Riders used some standard-issue gear and some of their own design, purchased with gift money. Diversity characterized the regiment, which included Ivy Leaguers, professional and amateur athletes, upscale gentlemen, cowboys, frontiersmen, Native Americans, hunters, miners, prospectors, former soldiers, tradesmen, and sheriffs. The Rough Riders were part of the cavalry division commanded by former Confederate General Joseph Wheeler, which itself was one of three divisions in the V Corps under Lt. Gen. William Rufus Shafter. Roosevelt and his men landed in Dickery, Cuba on June 23, 1898, and marched to Siboney. Wheeler sent parts of the 1st and 10th Regular Cavalry on the lower road northwest and sent the Rough Riders on the parallel road running along a ridge up from the beach. To throw off his infantry rival, Wheeler left one regiment of his cavalry division, the 9th, at Siboney so that he could claim that his move north was only a limited reconnaissance if things went wrong. 
Roosevelt was promoted to colonel and took command of the regiment when Wood was put in command of the brigade. The Rough Riders had a short, minor skirmish known as the Battle of Las Guasimas, they fought their way through Spanish resistance and, together with the regulars, forced the Spaniards to abandon their positions. Under his leadership, the Rough Riders became famous for the charge up Kettle Hill on July 1, 1898, while supporting the regulars. Roosevelt had the only horse, and rode back and forth between rifle pits at the forefront of the advance up Kettle Hill, an advance that he urged despite the absence of any orders from superiors. He was forced to walk up the last part of Kettle Hill, because his horse had been entangled in barbed wire. The victories came at a cost of 200 killed and 1,000 wounded. Roosevelt commented on his role in the battles, On the day of the big fight I had to ask my men to do a deed that European military writers consider utter. Considered to be opposing the president. The president secured his own nomination, but his preferred vice presidential running mate, Robert R. Hitt, was not nominated. Senator Charles Warren Fairbanks of Indiana, a favorite of conservatives, gained the nomination. While Roosevelt followed the tradition of incumbents in not actively campaigning on the stump, he sought to control the campaign's message through specific instructions to cordial you. He also attempted to manage the press's release of White House statements by forming the Ananias Club. Any journalist who repeated a statement made by the president without approval was penalized by restriction of further access. The Democratic Party's nominee in 1904 was Alton Brooks Parker. Democratic newspapers charged that Republicans were extorting large campaign contributions from corporations, putting ultimate responsibility on Roosevelt, himself. Roosevelt denied corruption while at the same time he ordered Cordell U to return $100,000 of a campaign contribution from Standard Oil. Parker said that Roosevelt was accepting corporate donations to keep damaging information from the Bureau of Corporations from going public. Roosevelt strongly denied Parker's charge and responded that he would go into the presidency unhampered by any pledge, promise, or understanding of any kind, sort, or description. Allegations from Parker and the Democrats, however, had little impact on the election, as Roosevelt promised to give every American a square deal. Roosevelt won 56% of the popular vote, and Parker received 38%. Roosevelt also won the Electoral College vote, 336 to 140. Before his inauguration ceremony, Roosevelt declared that he would not serve another term. Democrats afterwards would continue to charge Roosevelt and the Republicans of being influenced by corporate donations during Roosevelt's second term. Second Term Troubles As his second term progressed, Roosevelt moved to the left of his Republican Party base and called for a series of reforms, most of which failed to pass Congress. Roosevelt's influence waned as he approached the end of his second term, as his promise to forego a third term made him a lame duck and his concentration of power provoked a backlash from many congressmen. He sought a national incorporation law, at a time when all corporations had state charters, called for a federal income tax despite the Supreme Court's ruling in Pollock v. Farmers Loan and Trust Co., and an inheritance tax. In the area of labor legislation, Roosevelt called for limits on the use of court injunctions against labor unions during strikes, injunctions were a powerful weapon that mostly helped business. He wanted an employee liability law for industrial injuries, preempting state laws, and an eight-hour workday for federal employees. In other areas he also sought a postal savings system, to provide competition for local banks, and he asked for campaign reform laws. The election of 1904 continued to be a source of contention between Republicans and Democrats. A congressional investigation in 1905 revealed that corporate executives donated tens of thousands of dollars in 1904 to the Republican National Committee. In 1908, a month before the general presidential election, 
Governor Charles N. Haskell of Oklahoma, former Democratic treasurer, said that senators beholden to Standard Oil lobbied Roosevelt, in the summer of 1904, to authorize the leasing of Indian oil lands by Standard Oil subsidiaries. He said Roosevelt overruled his Secretary of Interior Ethan A. Hitchcock and granted a pipeline franchise to run through the Osage lands to the Prairie Oil and Gas Company. The New York Sun made a similar accusation and said that Standard Oil, a refinery who financially benefited from the pipeline, had contributed $150,000 to the Republicans in 1904 after Roosevelt's alleged reversal allowing the pipeline franchise. Roosevelt branded Haskell's allegation as a lie, pure and simple and obtained a denial from Shaw that Roosevelt had neither coerced Shaw nor overruled him. Post-Presidency Election of 1908 Roosevelt enjoyed being president and was still relatively youthful, but felt that a limited number of terms provided a check against dictatorship. Roosevelt ultimately decided to stick to his 1904 pledge not to run for a third term. He personally favored Secretary of State Elihu Root as his successor, but Root's ill health made him an unsuitable candidate. New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes loomed as potentially strong candidate and shared Roosevelt's progressivism, but Roosevelt disliked him and considered him to be too independent. Instead, Roosevelt settled on his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, who had ably served under Presidents Harrison, McKinley and Roosevelt in various positions. Roosevelt and Taft had been friends since 1890, and Taft had consistently supported President Roosevelt's policies. Roosevelt was determined to install the successor of his choice, and wrote the following to Taft, Dear Will. Do you want any action about those federal officials? I will break their necks with the utmost cheerfulness if you say the word. Just weeks later he branded as false and malicious, the charge was that he was using the offices at his disposal to favor Taft. At the 1908 Republican convention, many chanted for four years more of a Roosevelt presidency but Taft won the nomination after Henry Cabot Lodge made it clear that Roosevelt was not interested in a third term. In the 1908 election, Taft easily defeated the Democratic nominee, three-time candidate William Jennings Bryan. Taft promoted a progressivism that stressed the rule of law, he preferred that judges rather than administrators or politicians make the basic decisions about fairness. Taft usually proved to be a less adroit politician than Roosevelt and lacked the energy and personal magnetism, along with the publicity devices, the dedicated supporters, and the broad base of public support that made Roosevelt so formidable. When Roosevelt realized that lowering the tariff would risk creating severe tensions inside the Republican Party by pitting producers, manufacturers and farmers, against merchants and consumers, he stopped talking about the issue. Taft ignored the risks and tackled the tariff boldly, encouraging reformers to fight for lower rates, and then cutting deals with conservative leaders that kept overall rates high. The resulting Payne Aldrich Tariff of 1909, signed into law early in President Taft's tenure, was too high for most reformers, and Taft's handling of the tariff alienated all sides. While the crisis was building inside the party, Roosevelt was touring Africa and Europe, to allow Taft to be his own man. Africa and Europe, 1909-1910 In March 1909, shortly after the end of his presidency, Roosevelt left New York for the Smithsonian Roosevelt African Expedition, a safari in East and Central Africa. Roosevelt's party landed in Mombasa, British East Africa, now Kenya, and traveled to the Belgian Congo, now Democratic Republic of the Congo, before following the Nile to Khartoum in modern Sudan. Financed by Andrew Carnegie and by his own writings, Roosevelt's party hunted for specimens for the Smithsonian Institution and for the American Museum of Natural History in New York. The group, led by the legendary hunter-tracker R.J. Cunningham, included scientists from the Smithsonian, and was joined from time to time by Frederick Silas, 
the famous big game hunter and explorer. Participants on the expedition included Kermit Roosevelt, Edgar Alexander Mearns, Edmund Heller, and John Alden Loring. Roosevelt and his companions killed or trapped approximately 11,400 animals, from insects and moles to hippopotamuses and elephants. The 1,000 large animals included 512 big game animals, including six rare white rhinos. Tons of salted animals and their skins were shipped to Washington, it took years to mount them all, and the Smithsonian shared many duplicate specimens with other museums. Regarding the large number of animals taken, Roosevelt said, I can be condemned only if the existence of the National Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, and all similar zoological institutions are to be condemned. He wrote a detailed account of the safari in the book African Game Trails, recounting the excitement of the chase, the people he met, and the flora and fauna he collected in the name of science. After his safari, Roosevelt traveled north to embark on a tour of Europe. Stopping first in Egypt, he commented favorably on British rule of the region, giving his opinion that Egypt was not yet ready for independence, paralleling his views about the Philippines. He refused a meeting with the Pope due to a dispute over a group of Methodists active in Rome, but met with Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. King George V of Great Britain, and other European leaders. In Oslo, Norway, Roosevelt delivered a speech calling for limitations on naval armaments, a strengthening of the permanent court of arbitration, and the creation of a League of Peace among the world powers. He also delivered the Romaine's lecture at Oxford, in which he denounced those who sought parallels between the evolution of animal life and the development of society. Though Roosevelt attempted to avoid domestic politics during his time abroad, he met with Gifford Pinchot, who related his own disappointment with the Taft administration. Pinchot had been forced to resign as head of the Forest Service after clashing with Taft's interior secretary, Richard Bullinger, who had prioritized development over conservation. Roosevelt returned to the United States in June 1910. Republican Party Schism Roosevelt had attempted to refashion Taft into a younger version of himself, but as soon as Taft began to display his individuality, the former president expressed his disenchantment. He was offended on election night when Taft indicated that his success had been possible not just through the efforts of Roosevelt, but also his brother Charlie. Roosevelt was further alienated when Taft, intent on becoming his own man, did not consult him about cabinet appointments. Roosevelt and other progressives were also dissatisfied over Taft's conservation policies and his handling of the tariff, which had indirectly concentrated more power in the hands of conservative party leaders in Congress. Returning from Europe, Roosevelt urged progressives to take control of the Republican Party at the state and local level and to avoid splitting the party in a way that would hand the presidency to the Democrats in 1912. Additionally, Roosevelt expressed optimism about the Taft administration after meeting with the president in the White House in June 1910. In August 1910, Roosevelt gave notable speech at Osawatomie, Kansas, which was the most radical of his career and initiated his public break with the Taft administration and the conservative Republicans. Advocating a program of new nationalism, Roosevelt emphasized the priority of labor over capital interests, a need to more effectively control corporate creation and combination, and proposed a ban on corporate political contributions. Returning to New York, Roosevelt began a battle to take control of the state Republican Party from William Barnes Jr., Tom Platt's successor as the state party boss. Taft had pledged his support to Roosevelt in this endeavor, and Roosevelt was outraged when Taft's support failed to materialize at the 1910 state convention. Roosevelt nonetheless campaigned for the Republicans in the 1910 elections, which saw the Democrats gain control of the House for the first time since the 1890s. Among the newly elected Democrats was New York State Senator Franklin Delano Roosevelt 
who argued that he represented his cousin's policies better than his Republican opponent. The Republican progressives interpreted the 1910 defeats as compelling argument for the complete reorganization of the party in 1911. Senator Robert M. La Follette Sr. of Wisconsin joined with Pinchot, William White, and California Governor Hiram Johnson to create the National Progressive Republican League. Their objectives were to defeat the power of political bossism at the state level and to replace Taft at the national level. Despite skepticism of La Follette's new league, Roosevelt expressed general support for progressive principles. Between January and April 1911, Roosevelt wrote a series of articles for the Outlook, defending what he called the great movement of our day, the progressive nationalist movement against special privilege, and in favor of an honest and efficient political and industrial democracy. With Roosevelt apparently uninterested in running in 1912, La Follette declared his own candidacy in June 1911. Roosevelt continually criticized Taft after the 1910 elections, and the break between the two men became final after the Justice Department filed an antitrust lawsuit against U.S. Steel in September 1911. Roosevelt was humiliated by the suit because he had personally approved of an acquisition that the Justice Department was now challenging. However, Roosevelt was still unwilling to run against Taft in 1912, he instead hoped to run in 1916 against whichever Democrat beat Taft in 1912. Election of 1912 Republican Primaries and Convention In November 1911, a group of Ohio Republicans endorsed Roosevelt for the party's nomination for president, the endorsers included James R. Garfield and Dan Hanna. This was notable, as the endorsement was made by leaders of President Taft's home state. Roosevelt conspicuously declined to make a statement requested by Garfield that he flatly refuse a nomination. Soon thereafter, Roosevelt said, I am really sorry for Taft. I am sure he means well, but he means well feebly, and he does not know how. He is utterly unfit for leadership and this is a time when we need leadership. In January 1912, Roosevelt declared if the people make a draft on me I shall not decline to serve. Later that year, Roosevelt spoke before the Constitutional Convention in Ohio, openly identifying as a progressive and endorsing progressive reforms even endorsing popular review of state judicial decisions. In reaction to Roosevelt's proposals for popular overrule of court decisions, Taft said, such extremists are not progressives they are political emotionalists or neurotics. Roosevelt began to envision himself as the savior of the Republican Party from defeat in the upcoming presidential election. In February 1912, Roosevelt announced in Boston, I will accept the nomination for president if it is tendered to me. I hope that so far as possible the people may be given the chance through direct primaries to express who shall be the nominee. Elihu Root and Henry Cabot Lodge thought that division of the party would lead to its defeat in the next election, while Taft believed that he would be defeated either in the Republican primary or in the general election. The 1912 primaries represented the first extensive use of the presidential primary, a reform achievement of the progressive movement. The Republican primaries in the South, where party regulars dominated, went for Taft, as did results in New York, Indiana, Michigan, Kentucky, and Massachusetts. Meanwhile, Roosevelt won in Illinois, Minnesota, Nebraska, South Dakota, California, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. Roosevelt also won Taft's home state of Ohio. These primary elections, while demonstrating Roosevelt's continuing popularity with the electorate, were not pivotal. The final credentials of the state delegates at the National Convention were determined by the National Committee, which was controlled by the party leaders headed by the incumbent president. Prior to the 1912 Republican National Convention in Chicago, Roosevelt expressed doubt about his prospects for victory, noting that Taft had more delegates and control of the Credentials Committee. His only hope was to convince party leaders that the nomination of Taft would hand the election to the Democrats, 
but party leaders were determined not to cede their leadership to Roosevelt. The Credentials Committee awarded almost all contested delegates to Taft, and Taft won the nomination on the first ballot. Black delegates from the South played a key role, they voted heavily for Taft and put him over the top. La Follette also helped Taft's candidacy, he hoped that a deadlocked convention would result in his own nomination, and refused to release his delegates to support Roosevelt. The Progressive, Bull Moose, Party Once his defeat at the Republican convention appeared probable, Roosevelt announced that he would accept the Progressive nomination on a Progressive platform and I shall fight to the end, win or lose. At the same time, Roosevelt prophetically said, My feeling is that the Democrats will probably win if they nominate a progressive. Bolting from the Republican Party, Roosevelt and key allies such as Pinchot and Albert Beveridge created the Progressive Party, structuring it as a permanent organization that would field complete tickets at the presidential and state level. It was popularly known as the Bull Moose Party, after Roosevelt told reporters, I'm as fit as a bull moose. At the 1912 Progressive National Convention, Roosevelt cried out, We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. California Governor Hiram Johnson was nominated as Roosevelt's running mate. Roosevelt's platform echoed his 1978 proposals, calling for vigorous government intervention to protect the people from the selfish interests. To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. This country belongs to the people. Its resources, its business, its laws, its institutions, should be utilized, maintained, or altered in whatever manner will best promote the general interest. This assertion is explicit. Mr. Wilson must know that every monopoly in the United States opposes the Progressive Party. I challenge him, to name the monopoly that did support the Progressive Party, whether, the Sugar Trust, the U.S. Steel Trust, the Harvester Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, the Tobacco Trust, or any other. Ours was the only program to which they objected, and they supported either Mr. Wilson or Mr. Taft. Though many Progressive Party supporters in the North were supporters of civil rights for blacks, Roosevelt did not give strong support to civil rights and ran a lily-white campaign in the South. Rival all-white and all-black delegations from four southern states arrived at the Progressive National Convention, and Roosevelt decided to seat the all-white delegations. Nevertheless, he won little support outside Mountain Republican strongholds. Out of nearly 1,100 counties in the South, Roosevelt won two counties in Alabama, one in Arkansas, seven in North Carolina, three in Georgia, 17 in Tennessee, two in Texas, one in Virginia, and none in Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, or South Carolina. Assassination Attempt On October 14, 1912, while campaigning in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Roosevelt was shot by a saloon keeper named John Flamung Schrank. The bullet lodged in his chest after penetrating his steel eyeglass case and passing through a thick, 50 pages, single-folded copy of the speech titled Progressive Cause Greater Than Any Individual, which he was carrying in his jacket. Roosevelt, as an experienced hunter and anatomist, correctly concluded that since he was not coughing blood, the bullet had not reached his lung, and he declined suggestions to go to the hospital immediately. Instead, he delivered his scheduled speech with blood seeping into his shirt. He spoke for 90 minutes before completing his speech and accepting medical attention. His opening comments to the gathered crowd were, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Afterwards, probes and an X-ray showed that the bullet had lodged in Roosevelt's chest muscle, but did not penetrate the pleura. Doctors concluded that it would be less dangerous to leave it in place than to attempt to remove it, and Roosevelt carried the bullet with him for the rest of his life. Election Results 
After the Democrats nominated Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey, Roosevelt did not expect to win the general election, as Wilson had compiled a record attractive to many progressive Democrats who might have otherwise considered voting for Roosevelt. Roosevelt still campaigned vigorously, and the election developed into a two-person contest between Wilson and Roosevelt despite Taft's presence in the race. Roosevelt respected Wilson, but the two differed on various issues, Wilson opposed any federal intervention regarding women's suffrage or child labor, he viewed these as state issues, and attacked Roosevelt's tolerance of large businesses. Roosevelt won 4.1 million votes, 27%, compared to Taft's 3.5 million, 23%. Wilson gained 6.3 million votes, 42% of the total, and a massive landslide in the Electoral College, with 435 electoral votes, Roosevelt won 88 electoral votes, while Taft won 8. Pennsylvania was the only eastern state won by Roosevelt, in the Midwest, he carried Michigan, Minnesota and South Dakota, in the West, California and Washington. Wilson's victory represented the first Democratic presidential election victory since Cleveland's 1,892 campaign, and it was the party's best performance in the Electoral College since 1,852. Roosevelt, meanwhile, garnered a higher share of the popular vote than any other third-party presidential candidate in history. 1913-1914 South American Expedition a friend of Roosevelt's, Father John Augustine Zom, persuaded Roosevelt to participate in an expedition to South America. To finance the expedition, Roosevelt received support from the American Museum of Natural History in return for promising to bring back many new animal specimens. Roosevelt's popular book, Through the Brazilian Wilderness describes his expedition into the Brazilian jungle in 1913 as a member of the Roosevelt Rondon Scientific Expedition, CO named after its leader, Brazilian explorer Candido Rondon. Once in South America, a new, far more ambitious goal was added, to find the headwaters of the Rio de Juvida, and trace it north to the Madeira and thence to the Amazon River. It was later renamed Roosevelt River in honor of the former president. Roosevelt's crew consisted of his son Kermit, naturalist Colonel Rondon, George K. Cherry, sent by the American Museum of Natural History, Brazilian Lieutenant Jao Lira, team physician Dr. Jose Antonio Cajazeira, and 16 skilled paddlers and porters. The initial expedition started somewhat tenuously on December 9, 1913 at the height of the rainy season. The trip down the River of Doubt started on February 27, 1914. During the trip down the river, Roosevelt suffered a minor leg wound after he jumped into the river to try to prevent two canoes from smashing against the rocks. The flesh wound he received, however, soon gave him tropical fever that resembled the malaria he had contracted while in Cuba 15 years before. Because the bullet lodged in his chest from the assassination attempt in 1912 was never removed, his health worsened from the infection. This weakened Roosevelt so greatly that six weeks into the adventure, he had to be attended to day and night by the expedition's physician and his son Kermit. By then, he could not walk because of the infection in his injured leg and an infirmity in the other, which was due to a traffic accident a decade earlier. Roosevelt was riddled with chest pains, fighting a fever that soared to 103 degrees Fahrenheit, 39 degrees Celsius, and at times made him delirious. Regarding his condition as a threat to the survival of the others, Roosevelt insisted he be left behind to allow the poorly provisioned expedition to proceed as rapidly as it could. Only an appeal by his son persuaded him to continue. Despite Roosevelt's continued decline and loss of over 50 pounds, 23 kilograms, Commander Rondon reduced the pace of the expedition to allow for his commission's map-making and other geographical tasks, which required regular stops to fix the expedition's position by sun-based survey. 
Upon Roosevelt's return to New York, friends and family were startled by his physical appearance and fatigue. Roosevelt wrote, perhaps prophetically, to a friend that the trip had cut his life short by ten years. For the rest of his few remaining years, he would be plagued by flare UPS of malaria and leg inflammations so severe as to require surgery. Before Roosevelt had even completed his sea voyage home, critics raised doubts over his claims of exploring and navigating a completely uncharted river over 625 miles, 1,006 kilometers, long. When he had recovered sufficiently, he addressed a standing room only convention organized in Washington, D.C., by the National Geographic Society and satisfactorily defended his claims. Final Years Roosevelt returned to the United States in May 1914. Though he was outraged by the Wilson administration's conclusion of a treaty that expressed sincere regret for the way in which the United States had acquired the Panama Canal Zone, he was impressed by many of the reforms passed under Wilson. Roosevelt made several campaign appearances for the progressives, but the 1914 elections were a disaster for the fledgling third party. Roosevelt began to envision another campaign for president, this time with himself at the head of the Republican Party, but conservative party leaders remained opposed to Roosevelt. In hopes of engineering a joint nomination, the Progressives scheduled the 1916 Progressive National Convention at the same time as the 1916 Republican National Convention. When the Republicans nominated Charles Evans Hughes, Roosevelt declined the Progressive nomination and urged his Progressive followers to support the Republican candidate. Though Roosevelt had long disliked Hughes, he disliked Wilson even more, and he campaigned energetically for the Republican nominee. However, Wilson won the 1916 election by a narrow margin. The Progressives disappeared as a party following the 1916 election and Roosevelt and many of his followers permanently rejoined the Republican Party. When World War I began in 1914, Roosevelt strongly supported the Allies and demanded a harsher policy against Germany, especially regarding submarine warfare. Roosevelt angrily denounced the foreign policy of President Wilson, calling it a failure regarding the atrocities in Belgium and the violations of American rights. In 1916, while campaigning for Hughes, Roosevelt repeatedly denounced Irish Americans and German Americans whom he described as unpatriotic, saying they put the interests of Ireland and Germany ahead of America's by supporting neutrality. He insisted that one had to be 100% American, not a hyphenated American who juggled multiple loyalties. In March 1917, Congress gave Roosevelt the authority to raise a maximum of four divisions similar to the Rough Riders, and Major Frederick Russell Burnham was put in charge of both the general organization and recruitment. However, President Wilson announced to the press that he would not send Roosevelt and his volunteers to France but instead would send an American expeditionary force under the command of General John J. Pershing. Roosevelt never forgave Wilson, and quickly published The Foes of Our Own Household, an indictment of the sitting president. Roosevelt's youngest son, Quinton, a pilot with the American forces in France, was shot down behind German lines on July 14, 1918, at the age of 20. It is said that Quinton's death distressed Roosevelt so much that he never recovered from his loss. Roosevelt's attacks on Wilson helped the Republicans win control of Congress in the off-year elections of 1918. He declined a request from New York Republican to run for another gubernatorial term, but attacked Wilson's 14 points, calling instead for the unconditional surrender of Germany. He was cautiously optimistic about the proposed League of Nations, but had reservations about its impact on United States sovereignty. Roosevelt was popular enough to contest the 1920 Republican nomination, but his health was broken by 1918 due to the lingering effects of malaria. His family and supporters threw their support behind Roosevelt's old military companion, General Leonard Wood 
but Taft supporter Warren G. Harding defeated Wood on the 10th ballot of the 1920 Republican National Convention. Death On the night of January 5, 1919, Roosevelt suffered breathing problems. After receiving treatment from his physician, Dr. George W. Fowler, he felt better and went to bed. Roosevelt's last words were, Please put out that light. James to his family servant James Amos. Between 4 o'clock and 4.15 the next morning, Roosevelt died in his sleep at Sagamore Hill after a blood clot had detached from a vein and traveled to his lungs. He was 60 years old. Upon receiving word of his death, his son Archibald telegraphed his siblings, The old lion is dead. Woodrow Wilson's vice president, Thomas R. Marshall, said that death had to take Roosevelt sleeping, for if he had been awake, there would have been a fight. Following a private farewell service in the North Room at Sagamore Hill, a simple funeral was held at Christ Episcopal Church in Oyster Bay. Vice President Thomas R. Marshall, Charles Evans Hughes, Warren Harding, Henry Cabot Lodge, and William Howard Taft were among the mourners. The snow-covered procession route to Young's Memorial Cemetery was lined with spectato. Please subscribe and thanks for watching.